I've been surrounded by women since I was very young. Like I have four aunties. My aunties were like second moms to me when I was growing up. Um, I spent a lot of time with them. I had a very fierce and loving grandma. And when they started to um, disappear, I knew that they were aging or sick. Then it was like preparing for that passing and also trying to understand, well, what does my role look like and how will I carry that not only in relation to my family, but also in relation to my community, to my nation, and how I connect with other people. Hi, I'm Tamara, and this is Telus Talks with Tamara Taggart. Today I'm speaking with Helen Knott. It's her second time on the podcast. This time we're talking about her new book, Becoming a Matriarch. It's a national bestseller, fantastic book. And today we dive into topics of grief, loss, and Helen's artistic process. I hope you enjoy the conversation. This podcast is brought to you by TELUS Smart Home Security. Secure, simplify, and easily monitor your home from anywhere using the Smart Home Security app. I really like it because my kids don't need to have a key anymore. They can just open the front door with a code and they don't have to worry about losing a key. Or better yet, I don't have to worry about them losing a key. You can visit telus.com slash smart home dash security to learn more about Canada's most trusted security provider. Helen, it's so good to see you again. It's so good to be here, Tamara. The last time we spoke on the podcast was for your first book, In In My Own Moccasins, which uh, definitely goes down as one of my favorite books of all time. I think I told everybody I know to read it. And it seems like everybody did read it uh, because the, you know, before we get into your new book, which is Becoming a Matriarch, um, how was that for you? Because I talked to you really at the beginning of In My Own Moccasins Exploding. And tell me how that was for you. Yeah, I think I remember when it came out and I got my first like reader message and I, and they were like, this book helped me and it helped me heal. And I was like, done. Like, even if nobody reads it again, like fulfilled its purpose, like check mark, I'm a happy girl. And it's still doing its work out there. Like just yesterday, I got a message from a reader in like the Manitoban area. And they were like, you know, it's done this for me in my life. And so it feels like the gift that keeps giving, like even to me, like being able to receive those messages and talk with people has been pretty amazing. And, you know, no one has any foresight about like how books are going to do. And I thought, yeah, you know, this book came into the world. It was like loved and cared for and it's finding its way into like the hands of the people that need it. And I was like, and the second book will come out and yeah, it'll do okay. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are talking about becoming a matriarch, uh, a memoir. And I love, like, I love the cover of the book so much. It's gorgeous. Thank you. That's actually from a photo. So my girlfriend, one of my best friends, took a picture of me in our territory. And I was gifted that Pendleton by a Cree brother for doing community work. And the feather that I'm holding, I used in a lot of like healing circles because my background's in social work. Right. So um, for me, and that picture was actually taken overlooking the Peace River Valley and the colors were similar in the sky. So I was like wrapped up in community care, had my like eagle feather for healing rooted in my territory. And when they were doing book covers, they initially had that photo on the cover. And I was like, can we see it like digit, like artsy based? I think that's the way to go. And when I seen it, I was like, wow, that's pretty amazing. So I love it. And the one who rendered like the artistic rendition, she did so good. It's gorgeous. It really, truly is. So when you were sitting down to, I mean, not that you were sitting down, because I don't think you ever do just sit down. I see your social media and you're always on the go, always, uh, you know, speaking to groups, doing your work um, and and raising a son. Um, so you're, you're a busy person for sure. Was writing a second book, did you feel pressure to follow up your first book or did it come naturally this book? I think I was just excited because I was like, 
oh, like I found out that I can write a book in the world. <laughs> like that's a real thing that I can do. And once you do something, it becomes more tangible. So I was excited to write a different book. But I also gave myself space. And I think initially I was like, I had a different idea of what I wanted to write. And then I experienced losses and it became something else. And I had to let it become what it needed to be. And I didn't necessarily feel pressure. I feel like maybe I feel a little bit more of that pressure now, now that there's two. Because I was like, one, you could be a one and done. And then you do two. And I was like, okay, like, what's next? (laughs) (laughs) I don't think you need to worry about anything other than people just want to read your stories and uh, your perspective. And this is really about, this book is really about was a lot about grief and uh, discovery. Um, you lost both of your both your mother and your grandmother um, in over like six months within a six month uh, passing. So, could you can you talk to us a little bit about what does it mean to become a matriarch? What is a matriarch to you? Yeah, and like from different tribes that concept or how people know what a matriarch is is so different like i was just in terrace and there they have a very matriarchal structure there's people that are raised into roles and it was like really beautiful to see and to be around so many strong indigenous women within a matriarchal culture and here It's more like matrilineal, just in terms of like, which means like location. So if you're going to get shacked up or if you're going to get married, you're going to be moving to the woman's community. I remember when I dated uh, a Blackfoot man, he's like, I told my grandma about you. And she was like, oh, she's from the North. Hey, like those Northern women. (laughs) And I was like, "Uh uh-huh. And so for me, this process of becoming is knowing that like, I've been surrounded by women since I was very young. Like I have four aunties. My aunties were like second moms to me when I was growing up. Um, I spent a lot of time with them. I had a very fierce and loving grandma. And when they started to um, disappear, I knew that they were aging or sick. Then it was like preparing for that passing. And also trying to understand, well, what does my role look like and how will I carry that not only in relation to my family, but also in relation to my community, to my nation and how I connect with other people and wanting to move into that space very mindfully because it is different, you know, like carrying myself in the world in a different way without my mom and my grandma in the wings. Like, I'm no longer a girl. I'm a woman. <laughs> I, you know, so I think like that also comes with like standing straight, you speak truth and being able to do that. And there's times where I'm I'm in a room and I'll be like, well, what would my auntie do? Like, how would my grandma approach this? And then also learning to go into a space of like, how am I going to do this? Because not everything was functional either. So it's like, what am I putting down? What am I picking up? And how am I moving forward? Wow. Do you, you say that it's different in, in, in the different, you know, territories, but there, women, <clears throat> we give life, right? We're life givers. And there's a, there's a, um, a connection there that is lost a lot in other cultures. And I guess, I guess by that, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to enter the conversation towards forgiveness and um, what that looks like when matriarchs are held to this, you know, this, they're held, they're lifted up. You know, being a mother is imperfect. It's hard. Uh, being a teenage girl is not easy. Being uh, a young girl, it's not, it's just, it's hard. Where does forgiveness fit into uh, becoming a matriarch? I think in terms of like first learning how to give myself grace for my imperfections, my shortcomings, the way that I failed. Um, You know, I have a son who's 16 and I know that I've raised him imperfectly. 
I've tried to do it to the best of my ability with therapy, with changing approaches that I grew up with. But I know, you know, there's going to be things where he's like, yeah, maybe I didn't really like the way that you did that. And I'm going to have to be okay with that and be like, good. Like, you take the good things from me. You change the things that you didn't want to happen for your children. I think with that grace with myself, then I could extend that to the people that came before me, the women that came before me, especially in regards to like, and this is why I think it's so important to speak about like history. And it's not saying like, trauma dumping on your children or whatever that looks like but at a certain age understanding like the complexities of the lives that my mom my aunties all of them held and then I could see in the spaces where they remained hard and how that was a protective function and worked for a really really long time but also being able to celebrate the ways that they were soft because I was like you could choose to not love at all with some of the lives or experiences that they had. But I was like, they they did. They loved, they showed up. They were imperfect. We're all imperfect on this human journey. And I think that forgiveness piece is huge in that regard. And even like, sometimes you might get that to that afterwards as well. And I also feel like forgiveness is so much about your own journey too, like releasing yourself to live in the world in whatever way that, that looks like and live in a good way. So yeah, forgiveness is all wrapped up in it. And I remember uh, one of my family members, um, because I always see myself as like my purpose. I'm like, okay, I'm here to like, you know, do all this healing work. I'm lightening the loads and da, 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 da. And there was one where I was like, I was crying. I was talking to my auntie. I was like, I just don't want to go. Like, I don't want to go. And uh, my, I had a family member in the hospital and there was like history there. And my auntie was like, you don't have to. You realize that. She's like, you've done a lot of healing work and repairing relationships. You've taken the first step with a lot of people. You've tried to show up in your best way. It's okay to put this one down and let that person like, move through it on their own and I remember just bawling because I was like I can put stuff down (laughs) yeah so that was a huge piece for me and to have someone that could say that to you that's a huge gift because I I think that a lot of times we don't have that voice we don't have that that care that care right and you said it was an auntie that said that to you and an auntie is a matriarch yeah, shout out to my littlest auntie. She's not the the youngest, but she's the shortest. And she's actually the one, like, we've been having these conversations for, I think, since before we lost my mom and grandma. Like, what will it look like when we are the heads of the family? How will we do this? How we, will we do it differently? So it hasn't just been me alone. I've had her as a touchstone throughout this process. Mm, mm. And how do you... I find it strange to be parenting. uh, Strange isn't the right word. I find it uh, hard. uh, Well, I find it difficult to parent my kids who are the same age as some of my hardest times. And it's just down deep. And it's always kind of, you know, there for me. No one else really knows about it. No one else is thinking about it like I am. Do you find that with your son? Not really, just because my son is so different than me. But what I do, I do some like mental comparisons just in like, I feel like he's so different in the world and I'm learning to give him more freedom to kind of roam about. But because I was like, at 13, I was catching greyhounds to other cities. Like at 15, I went down to Seattle or Tacoma by myself to visit my family. Like, and he's 16 and has done none of these outings like <laughs> without me, well, right? It's the same with me, but I think that's my fault for like not hel- helicoptering him, my kids. But you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, oh, no, like I, I still say to my 15 year old daughter, oh, you're going to walk and get a bubble tea. OK, well, just make sure that you're, you know, you're looking both ways when you cross the street because it's super busy at that. And she looks at me like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, I, I can't. I can't help it. I mean, at 15, I was living on my own. 
Whereas I'm telling her to look both ways, you know, before she crosses the street. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you're going to go to the gym. It's kind of late. Can you please share your location with me? And he's like, mom. Yeah. (laughs) And so that's what I mean by difficult. It's difficult for me, I guess, to let go, to trust, to, you know, so I'm wondering if you find that or if you're more, um, how are you finding that transition into this? into being the matriarch into becoming the the... I think it's still like a process of learning like you don't know in what ways you have to fill roles or step into space until you're met with the event that asks you to so sometimes it's like I can have all of these conversations and thought pieces but I I really won't know until it comes like my my eldest auntie my mom's um older sister she was very much like fierce in the community did a lot of work for the region uh was very loving very ruthless as well as a lot of the women in my family have been and uh but she was the person i would go to for directions for any types of like history pieces to talk my dreams out with like for spiritual guidance and she passed in september and uh And it was just so different because the landscape had changed again. And I was like, okay. And then even when we were making decisions, I'm like, okay, I sit at the table for my family. I'm the rep. I'm the person also that's making a lot of these very grown up decisions where before I was a child and like cousins my age are not here at this table. It is me. (laughs) I am here. Um, And then realizing like, okay, like I'm the person probably that people will also call to talk dreams out with. Like I am now one of those people that my auntie was still for me. And so it's shifting and changing and it is a continual process of becoming, learning and refining. And we're humans, so we get a little regressive sometimes in our behaviors, right? So it's never like a straight line. Like I learned how to set boundaries. I didn't cross those again with my family. Like... I was still relearning that, like even afterwards. Tell us a little bit about let's let's start with your grandma. Can you tell us a little bit about your grandmother? Yeah, uh, my grandma Junie Bigfoot. She was an amazing storyteller. She would always like pretend that she wasn't a great storyteller, but she was. Like her body became the story. Um, and my grandma like would put me to sleep with back scratches. And one of my favorite things is like. The memory of berries because I went from her. Her berries are a love language, like always making sure we had berries. And when wild strawberries came out, and the wild strawberries are so tiny, right? They're like your fingernail. Grandma would go and like pick a full bowl and then present it to you and be like, here, baby. And then you would have this like thing that when you were little, you were just like, this is delicious, like all these little berries, but you don't realize how long she had to sit there picking to fill a full bowl. And for me, that's like a testament to the ways in which I was loved, Um, very loving. And it's funny because I think sometimes when we look at individuals uh, in like a literary sense, like when you're reading about real people (laughs) and or movies or whatever, when it's out there, you want someone you're like either they're loving or they're not loving. And we leave very little room for this duality, this space where People can be very loving, but also have a lot of issues, you know, in ways that they were very imperfect in the way that they showed up for people. Because, you know, that's the world that I grew up in, where my grandma could also be very, like, fierce, very mean sometimes, <laughs> like, pouty, too. And, uh, but also really stuck in some of the, the the harm, you know, and I watched her cycle around stories sometimes like sometimes they were the good stories but sometimes they were the very hard stories where she experienced like really bad things in her life and held space for a lot of those memories and I remember at one point with her I just remember thinking like you know this is where she's at and I just have to show up and love her unconditionally because I feel like my grandma was more loving than she was like a lot of the the other things you know that came from time to time and being like yeah, I'm just going to love her. And I, I don't, and I, I know that people are listening, so I'm not going to say that that's the case for everything either. Sometimes there needs to be boundaries, right? Sometimes you need to step away. Um, 
but yeah, she she loved me very well and prayed for me um, in so many ways that you know I feel like it's a testament to. You shared some really beautiful you know moments that you had with her on social media, whether it be like hand holding or you know her telling a story or, um, and so it really allows. Uh, and, you know, anybody who reads your work uh, is familiar with her because they probably follow you on social media and and have had those glimpses because you are a very uh, generous uh, storyteller with your with your own story and uh, your own moments. What about your mom? Yeah, my mama, um, Shirley Bigfoot, shout and not. Uh, she was like. It was interesting, like, watching her grow into herself because my mom used to be super shy. Like, and same with my grandma. Like, my grandma didn't go into social spaces, but my mom was, like, quiet when she went into places. And when she was little, like, she wanted nothing more to, like, love Jesus and, like, have a family. And then she had that. And she was a phenomenal mom in my early years. Like, Sunday school teacher, did all the crafts, made things for me by hand. Like if we couldn't afford them, like I had matching scrunchies, matching breaths, like she did everything. And then, you know, there was a period of time where I think it was just like surrender and she was like in addiction, didn't drink for most of my life. And there was a period of like four years that were pretty intense, pretty brutal. I think there was a lot of sadness that needed to come out. And what I saw afterwards, like as my mom grew older, um, she finally, because I think she was like definitely like people pleasing in her nature, like taking care of people. It was beautiful to watch her to be like, I don't care anymore. Like, I'm going to call people out. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to laugh loud. And seeing her enter that era of her life was amazing. And I was so proud for her and happy for her. And, you know, she sacrificed a lot for me to succeed. My mom dropped out in grade eight and she would always tell me like, you know, I want you to make something of yourself and made sure that as a single mom, I could still, you know, engage in the opportunities because she's like, I want you to be able to take care of yourself, that you will always have a choice no matter what in the world. And I do because of her. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you spoke uh, briefly there about, you know, addiction and uh, you've had your own journey. You're, you're um, I mean, you just celebrated a big number, didn't you? I'm coming up actually soon. April 7th will be my 12 years of sobriety. Wow. Congratulations. That's big. And it's a, it's, a, you, you're very again, transparent about your journey with this um, and and what you've had to, you know, learn and the self-reflection that you've had to, because this isn't, it's, what I'm learning from you is that, you know, becoming a matriarch is, I, I, I just hear so much, um, uh, I, I keep coming back to the word forgiveness, but it's it's acceptance, you know, uh, of of people and their own journey, and I, I think a lot of us are very closed off to that. So it's like you hurt my feelings. I'm done with you. Uh, I'm never going to speak to you again. Like I, I, I have lived a lot in that bubble. <laughs> um, does addiction play into that? Um, inability to forgive and accept? Probably. I think about like the relationship with my mom and, you know, early on in terms of like who was able to enter in a space of forgiveness with her quickly. I think it was like more me, but probably because I was like, I know what it's like to be a bad human out here in my behaviors and hurt people that I love. Like I've been there. I've also been like the person that people have like discounted for various reasons and sometimes like called for. Like I have not been my best version of self in the world. And I think that and coming from that space where it's been like a healing process, a letting go, a learning how to release shame 
and being able to move in the world in a different way and um, allow that space for humanness with other people. I think there is that. And especially within like relationships where I'm like, there's so much love that is salvageable here. There's relationship that is salvageable here. How do we move forward? Also, at the same time, like out in the world with new relationships, like I am one of those people. I'm like, if you're shady, like we're that's not happening. <laughs> so <laughs> there is that space too where I'm like, you know, I do protect my peace and protect my energy as well, and I think that's important. Yeah, it sure is. So um, I just want to mention that we always like to thank our go- our guests for being here, and um, uh, we ask them to choose a Canadian nonprofit that means something. Uh, to them, you chose True North Aid. Thank you for choosing them. I know you were just working uh, with them on something, and um, we will be giving them a gift uh, as a thank you for you being here. So, big thank you for choosing them. So, when you know, if you're, we, who is this book for? And and I know that them that's a big question, but I, you know. A man might look at this and be like, oh, becoming a matriarch, I don't need to read this book. I I, I think actually you do need to read this book, <laughs> yeah, actually. Um, but I'm just curious, like when you were writing it, 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 to me, it's a gift to all women, right? And I know you, you probably had, maybe you had someone specific in mind, maybe you didn't, but the, the, the acceptance that you allow is such a gift to everybody. And so I'm wondering when you were writing this book, did you have that in mind that this was a gift for so many people? I don't really know because I I know I wrote my first book with a very intentional audience, right? It was like spelled out in the introduction, like this is who it's for. And then this one was like, I just need to write. And then there was a moment too where I remember I was in like the last quarter of it and I wanted to add in all of these things that didn't feel natural for me to add in but I was like I feel like these are expectations of me like to put this in the book and then it was like funny because this book is so much about permission and like allowing yourself to show up so I had to let go of that and I know that I agree with you in terms of um, men being able to take something from it and men needing to to read that as well because there's so much in terms of dynamics and relationships and what that looks like uh usually the men in my family don't read my books um <laughs> they just don't and it's never been something i pushed i'm like okay and uh i had a male relative like read it and they approached me after and they were like i'm sorry you know that you held so much like i'll do better to hold some of that on my own so that you're not also taking care in these ways of me, like, or taking care of me in these ways. And I just cried. And I was like, okay, because it was like the silence that was there, right? Over these things. And the way that women, a lot of the times, will carry in silence. Um, I did a writing workshop recently and was talking with a lot of women, a lot of them, like, probably in their, like, 60s, around their 60s. And it was interesting talking about this concept of truth and how they were like but how do we shield people like how do we and I was like oh this like the truth is so burdensome right (laughs) and so yeah I think a lot for for women um from all different different backgrounds you know because we I feel like lost is a universal language and we have to we all lose like our moms at some point in this world so yeah and it's a lot of times, a very complicated relationship. Uh, I don't, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head that doesn't have some sort of, or did at some point have a complicated relationship with their mother. And what you just said, where people are like, oh, well, how do we shield them from the truth? Like, and that's our protective, you know, us wanting to protect the ones we love around us. You know, the world is perfect. Don't worry. Don't, you, there's nothing bad to see here. Um, where does patience fit into this, the, you know, the, uh, the process of healing, uh, 
we like to do everything. Well, many of us like to just kind of like get it done and move on to the next thing. I've got a big to-do list. Healing from this is not on my to-do list. Um, you know, I'd rather just forget about it. But it it does take patience, right? Oh, yeah. I feel like it's an, sometimes an inconvenience for something to show up in the middle of your work day or whenever, you know, and you're outside and the sun is shining and then, you know, you want to blubber or whatever that looks like and feeling that frustration because I've felt that before where I'm like frustrated and I'm like, I just want to be happy. Why am I back here again? What does this look like? And patience is so key. I think of an experience that I had like two summers ago and it was like a very like intense, not setback, but um, I would say like old memory being pulled forward because they like to heal in a straight line and it's not like that, right? There's no steps. We like to put them in steps too, like steps one through five and then yay, like you're free. It doesn't work like that. And it's a slow process and I feel like there's less and less of that that memory or that story coming back um, at different points in your journey that will kind of throw you back. And the way that I explained it to someone because I was sitting with them and I remember the first time like they were tightly wound around their story and I could sense it by the way that they talked, their patterns. And then I seen them a few months later and, you know, they were able to go off in different conversations and talk about different things. And I was like, oh baby, like your orbit is bigger your orbit is way wider. Like you, you're that much further from those hard stories that you carry and you're able to like experience more. And uh, when I felt that experience like two years ago, I remember feeling very upset because I was like, why am I back here? I don't want to be back here again. Like I was like crying, angry. It was a really big, like, I don't like using the word trigger. I don't, <laughs> but it was a very big like setback and um or even step back and uh there was a moment like a day later where i was like oh you know this is coming back so that you can clear it oh you're gonna have that much more freedom once you work through this this is just coming up just so that you can create more space for yourself to love to live and to experience joy and in that moment i was like all right and just accepted it was almost like i was grateful for it which was weird um And then I worked through it and I was like, okay, we're putting this because it's not going to come back like this again. You know, we're letting this go. And I think when you start creating more space for yourself like that, you can feel it. And it is like such a worthwhile endeavor. Mm. Oh, Helen, I love talking to you. Um, Becoming a Matriarch, a memoir. So good. It's uh, available wherever you buy your favorite books online, in person, Uh, Again, another book where you sit down and you cannot put it down, uh, just like your first book, In My Own Moccasins. Your website, Helen, is fiercewithheart.com, and she's on Instagram, all your beautiful pictures, at helennot05. I can't thank you enough for being here. I love talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tell Us Talks with Tamara Taggart. Be sure to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for another conversation. You can also check out our website, tellus.com slash podcast, and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Tell Us Talks. 